Looking for strategies to help you protect your portfolio in these uncertain times? Visit robblack.com. Robblack.com. Powered by EP Wealth. Wall Street works in funny ways. I certainly wouldn't have expected what's happening between the Palestinians and Israelis. Maybe I would have expected it to be fair. And Wall Street's not really paying attention. Wall Street works in funny ways. Wholesale inflation in the U.S. rose the most since April. That's not good news. The Labor Department reported that its producer price index, which measures inflation before it hits consumers, climbed 2.2% from a year earlier. Not a bad number. On a month-to-month basis, prices rose one half a percent from August to September. That's not a good number. Wholesale prices have been rising more slowly than consumer prices, raising hopes that inflation may continue to ease as producers' costs make their way ultimately to the consumer. Um, Rates have come down. Remember how rates and energy prices kind of went up for the whole entire third quarter? Well, now they're kind of moving the other direction. Not quite. Um, oil went from 65 to 95. Now it's at 84. If Iran gets involved with the Palestinians, all bets are off the table. 10-year treasury sits at 4.6%, a, a big move lower from 495 And again, it was a very crowded trade for three to four months in a row. Epic, if you will. Um, Huge move. Let's talk about some of the other issues that are out there. Stories, investments, strategies. I got some good uh, stock talk for you today, for sure. NASDAQ was up one half percent yesterday. The SP 500 up one half percent. The Dow Jones Industrial Average up four tenths of a percent. Even the Russell 2000 did well. I like it when the Russell 2000 does well. Even though I like the S&P 500 for the average everyday man, I know that the average everyday man typically in their 401k doesn't just put it in the S&P 500. That's what we've been missing this year. And that could be what works next year. Pepsi was a huge winner yesterday, up to almost 2%. Why do I say huge? Because the Olympic story of Americans eating less junk food. And I would consider Doritos junk food. Um, has hit the stock pretty hard. Hamas has fundraised using crypto. It's a bit of a story out there that's not going to go well for investors in crypto. Israel's frozen multiple accounts on the cryptocurrency exchange Binance that it believes Hamas was using to raise money. The cyber arm of the Israeli police announced yesterday it's not yet clear if the shuttered accounts directly financed last weekend's assault on Israeli civilians. Israel has seized 190 other Binance wallets it linked to Hamas or the Islamic State since 2021. Hamas began publicly fundraising crypto in 2019 via its Telegram channel and raised about 30,000 in Bitcoin for one wallet that year. Between 2021 and 2023, about 41 million worth of crypto is deposited in crypto wallets linked to Hamas. For everyone who is against Digital currencies, this is a dream come true. This kind of story just ruins um, politicians' careers if they don't regulate and stop back-to-war financing of terrorism. Biden called the Hamas attack sheer evil. There was some just heartbreaking stories coming out, and I'll be fair on both sides. George Santos is, would be funny on any other day when we're not talking about Hamas and babies. Representative George Santos charged with stealing donors' IDs. He stole constituents' IDs and their credit cards and ring up charges on them. If convicted, time in prison. That's just, it's almost too stupid to be true, right? California is going to ban some popular candy ingredients. Red dye number three, potassium bromate, brominated vegetable oil, 
and pro- <laughs> it's easy for me to say probably incorrectly these uh basically are a skittles bat um the law takes effect in 2027 now the chemical found in skittles was removed already but it is interesting to note Carolyn Ellison said she committed crimes with Sam Bankman Freed. Um, I find her to be a fascinating character. Um, and I don't know why. She's the former CEO of Alameda Research, the crypto hedge fund that the government claims FTX illegally used customer funds to prop up. <clears throat> she testified that Sam Bankman Freed instructed her to use FTX customer money to pay off Alameda loans. Alameda took $14 billion in FTX customer funds. Sam Bankman Freed believed he had a 5% chance of becoming the US president which is just goofy, but it just shows you the whole story is again, a black guy for crypto. The guy who invented the duty free stores, he, he passed away. It was 92 years old. Uh, he donated over 8 billion to various causes while keeping him easily 2 million for his retirement. I think that was the interesting part of it. He could have lived way larger. I could live way larger and I don't, it's really odd. I'm not comparing myself to a billionaire, though. Adobe updated a version of Firefly, its AI image generator, which it says can create images of humans that look well more human. Utah sued TikTok, claiming that the app hurts children's mental health. Arkansas and Indiana previously filed similar suits. The House of Representatives is expected to vote on a new speaker today, but it's unclear whether they have enough votes to get it through. GM reached a tentative deal with the union representing its Canadian workers. After more than 4,000 employees in Canada went on strike. Meanwhile, the UAW strike in the U.S. is ongoing. <clears throat> it's going to get more and more sticky. Just throwing that down there for you. Um, taking a look at today, whirlwind of information that we have to digest. Exxon is acquiring Pioneer Natural Resources for $59 billion. What that tells you is Exxon thinks oil is cheap. Energy is cheap. <clears throat> a value for them. They're not going out and drilling and spinning. They're spending on acquiring it. Walgreens Boot Alliance and Sherman Williams both announced new CEOs. Birkenstock's going to go public today. I took a look at the IPO and maybe I'll talk about it. Maybe I won't. I'm not sure. Samsung reported better than feared operating results. Kidney dialysis services to Vita and Baxter are seeing sizable losses on the heels of the new Novo Nordisk drug. The once weekly injectable because of an independent monitoring committee said the results met uh, pre-specified criteria for stopping the trial early for efficacy. So you get overweight, your kidneys go. You take a drug to lose weight and companies that help you with your kidneys struggle, not just Pepsi and Coca-Cola and McDonald's. You can find me online at robblackshow.com. That's robblackshow.com. I got a lot of content to get to today. But I do want to mention, because attendance is so far pretty sparse, I have a big event coming up. Um, It is going to be in San Mateo at the Crown Plaza, October 28th, seven tests of retirement readiness. You can secure your spot by going to robblackshow.com. It's robblackshow.com. It's 10 to noon, Foster City. Perfect location. You can find it the information at robblackshow.com. Think you're in good shape for retirement? Find out how you're really doing with the seven tests of retirement readiness. Join Rob Black and CFP Chad Burton of EP Wealth Advisors Saturday, October 28th in San Mateo. They'll walk you through these seven tests to find out whether you are really ready for the retirement you want. Rob will provide timely commentary, and Chad will share specific strategies for taxes, income, long-term care, safe money, investing, life goals, and more. If you have at least $500,000 in investable assets and want to retire better, pass on your estate, and minimize taxes, this event is for you. Find out if you're on the right track with the seven tests of retirement readiness, Saturday, October 28th, 10 a.m. to noon at the Crown Plaza in San Mateo. Space is limited, so sign up today at robblackshow.com. That's robblackshow.com. Can you pass all seven tests? Sign up today online at robblackshow.com. Stock recessions real quick. There's talk that one might be coming. I'm okay with that. I've lived through many of them. 
I can honestly tell you, I don't have one emotional tie to the word recession. And I can't think of, oh, I remember that that one time me and my family lost our farm and we had to eat dirt. I have nothing like that in my head. Rate hikes usually precede recessions, and we've had a lot of rate hikes. When it comes to igniting a recession, no one has more firepower than strip banks. We are starting to see more of the consumer getting hit. Walmart CEO talked about it yesterday. Recessions used to be a lot more frequent. Back in the old days, like before World War II, long periods of economic boom were pretty rare worldwide. Back then, economies were mostly based on agriculture, which made them more vulnerable to things like bad weather and tended to lead to ups and downs in production. Before 1982, now we're starting to talk about our lifetime, right? The average economic expansion lasted just 2.8 years, and an overall whopping 35% of the time was spent in recession. So that's a long time. Belton. Since 1982, however, it's been a different story. Average time the U.S. has spent in good economic groove or expansions has been about 8.6 years, up from 2.8 pre-82. 2.8 pre-82. 8.6 years of expansion post-1982. And of all the time we live on this planet, only 8% of it since 1982 has been during a recession. They don't typically last very long in the United States. Before 1982, About one-third of the time was spent in recessions. The economy still grew at a solid 3.7% rate. In the past four decades, we figured out how to manage things much smoother. And again, you can look at post-82, post-World War II, pre-1982, pre-World War II. So recession tends to last about eight months now. That's not awful. Now, they could last, I would say, uh, six to uh, 36 months. And I'm okay with that. You have to give back when you take. I don't think they're a bad thing. I think they clean up what happened in an economic boom. You can look at the dot-com era when I moved to the Bay Area in 2000, roughly. That It was tough to get a a reservation. It was tough to get a date. It was, I, my salary was middle of the road. And in any other city in the country, it felt like I I would have been like top 10% or top 20%. Um, Everyone was making good dollars in the tech economy. And when that went away in 2000, 2002, it sent the pretenders home. I'm still standing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think recession should become more common if high inflation persists. Um, and I just think that's kind of a textbook example of what inflation does. Sectors with high dividend yields and bonds perform best during recessions. Uh, But this last two years, or I guess you could say 22 months, have been just miserable for bonds. Telling you, if we do go into recession, might be the time to say, oh, maybe it's time for me to turn on this. How's your 401k doing after 2022 for retirement age Americans? Not so well. Fidelity said the average 401k balance for millennials stood at 48,300 through June, up from 48,000 at the close of 2021. Baby boomers are still underwater, though. The average 401k account for boomers, 220,000, compared with 249,000 at the end of 2021. Last year was the worst year ever for stocks and bonds. Combined bonds lost 13.7%. Stocks lost about 18.6%. This year has been a dramatic turnaround, but we still have work to put in. And I think we will in the back half, not the back half, gosh, in the last quarter. So I am not thinking we go up to 30% on the S&P 500, but I could certainly see 20 
Um, so I see some upside from here. One of the stocks that I've talked about in the past just got an upgrade and it got the upgrade for the same freaking fracking reason that I talk about. Raymond James upgraded take two. There's some TTWO to outperform. They put a price target of $170 on it. It's currently $145. They said a relatively slower period in front of uh, new releases is typical. They make video games. I should just stop and say that. No, no. They make the Taylor Swift of video games. Grand Theft Auto. And it's been really... We should, according to Raymond James, see a trailer on Grand Theft Auto 6 soon which should take away the most prominent point of uncertainty around the financial tra trajectory of the company. When that comes out, they're going to make billions and billions and billions. And it's a franchise that wins. They're gaining increased confidence in the shape of the X rockstar portfolio and a path to more consistent, sustainable releases with a stronger number of shots on goal. They have a reasonable valuation based on assumptions for higher earnings after the Grand Theft Auto six release. So basically, the upgrade says, we think Grand Theft Auto 6 is going to get some news soon because it hasn't gotten any news recently. And it's been in development for a long time. And the Xbox Series X and the PlayStation 5 have been out now for a couple of years. So they want to get their game on that platform to take advantage of the graphic powers before a new platform is announced. Just throwing it down there. I kind of see what, but I, I do feel like Raymond James is guessing. But we've seen worse, right? <laughs> uh, what else do we have to hit? Uh, I'm looking at upgrades and downgrades. Palo Alto Networks, which is a stock that always interests me, was initiated with by William O'Neill. Uh, One. Sprouts Farmers Market unveiled a new Southern California distribution center. The new state-of-the-art facility is strategically positioned to enhance the efficiency and freshness of produce delivered to over 95 Sprout stores. Um, I'm not big into groceries as far as investments go. You, it, sometimes I just talked about like, I, I, I kind of am okay with video games. On the other hand, I'm kind of not great with groceries. Um, even though Target and Walmart technically have groceries and they're technically... Uh, investable, in my opinion. Uh, the one that, you know, again, makes me scrape my head is like, yeah, Sprouts Farmer's Market, it's expensive when you go in there. And if we do hit a recession, people are going to start going to the dollar store for, for groceries when they can, if that makes sense. You can find me online at Rob Black Show, Twitter, Rob Black Show, YouTube, Rob Black Show. I'm Rob Black, big event coming up October 28th in San Mateo at the Crown Plaza. Sign up at robblackshow.com. Don't want to work forever? Check out the retirement planning guide on robblack.com. That's robblack.com, powered by EP Wealth. I've got two teenage boys, and I am shocked at the number that I'm about to read to you. What percentage of teenagers in the United States do you think own iPhones? What percentage of teenagers? Just get a number in your head. 25, 50, 75. Got that number? Well, here it is. Here's the answer. 87%. Wow. I've been working with Patrick O'Hare, briefing.com, since before there was an iPhone. Many years before the iPhone. He comes to us from briefing.com, a reliable source of domestic and international news. I use the source twice during the day, once at the beginning of the day and once at the end of the day. If I were active in the markets during the day, I'd use it during the day as well. Patrick, your site is wonderful. Um, I start my day every day with your... Um, and I end my week every day with your big picture column. Um, welcome to the show. And what are we seeing in the markets these days? Uh, good morning, Rob. It's good to be back with you. And I must admit, you're making me feel old this morning. But here we are. Um, I have four children, all of which are teenagers, and all of which have an iPhone as well. But Isn't that crazy? That said, that said, we um, we have a market that's um, you know trying to build on its on its recent rebound effort. It's a little bit more uh, 
cautious looking today, if, if you will. I think that, uh, you know, there's clearly a lot of uncertainty uh, in the mix. Not that there isn't always uncertainty, but there's a heightened sense of uncertainty now, given the Israel-Hamas conflict. Um, you know, we were hearing uh, today, too, that, you know, that the uh, Republicans in the House are going to try and convene to figure out who the next speaker could be. Um you know, and then we just have a kind of a wait and see attitude, I think, partly in front of the uh, September CPI number on Thursday. Um, but we've had a nice we've have had a nice bounce here. Um, you know, it kind of has coincided with a drop in, in, in interest rates, particularly long term rates. Um, and now I think there's just a little bit of a uh, wait and see to, to, to figure out if that trend continues or if we go back to the point of where, you know, interest rates act up and stocks uh, run into some resistance. So I'm not as good at this as you are um, in any way, shape or form. But what I was seeing was the third quarter had an overweighted trade in energy and an overweighted trade in the 10 year treasury. It was just all one sided and it was all moving higher. Um, And then in the last two weeks, it's kind of broken. Is that a right mm-hmm. way of saying it? Overweighted? Yeah, and and I think you know there's a part of this sort of uh, wait and see, you know, mentality I'm talking about, right? Is that the the move we've seen up in the stock market recently too is was a bit of a positioning squeeze, if you will. Um, you know, we knew coming into the week that put the call ratios had did uh, and just the, the the narrative and the tone overall. You, you, you know, was you could feel it. It was everything was negative, right? And so, typically, or a lot of times anyway, uh, when you get into an environment like that, and everyone's leaning to one side of the boat, you know, the market goes to the other side. And I think, you know, when when the price action moves against what the prevailing belief is, is where it should be going, you tend you'll get that short covering activity that can kind of lead to some fast and and, and you know sizable gains. And so we have to kind of figure out here, are we moving just on a kind of a technical trade here, or is it really a fundamentally driven trade? And and it's, it's tough to make the distinction at the moment because you can kind of, you know, uh, rationally argue both sides of it because you've had long-term rates come down now uh, nicely, which is a good thing. But why are they coming down? Um, you know, predominantly, I'd say a safe haven flows, also some short covering activity in the treasury market. Um, so, you know, if Things settle down, and, and, and hopefully they will in terms of the Israel-Hamas conflict, and you don't see anything, you know, broaden out that would involve any armed conflict between Israel and Iran, um, you know, you could potentially then see that safe haven trade move back out of treasuries, and then you go back to focusing on the matters that were kind of, um, you know, helping to drive rates higher to begin with, and the deficit issue is front and center in that respect. So. You're just kind of a little bit in no man's land right now, and you have a market that's going to be range bound uh, as it tries to figure these things out. I like how you put that. I'm trying to digest it on the fly. Um, the whole Israel Palestinian affair, you and I have seen numerous times in our career, and we forget that, or we kind of uh, let the memory fade that. It doesn't have a, as much risk to oil as it used to. Pre 1970s, it was bad if there was conflicts in the Middle East, but now it doesn't seem to really impact as much. And there's multiple reasons why, but um, I'm always shocked that I, I tend to forget things like that. Um, how about earning season? Um, we're in yeah. October now, so that's starting to roll out. Right, right. We're about ready to kind of get rolling there. PepsiCo reported earlier this week, uh, better than expected results, raised its outlook. You know, so that's certainly a, a good start there for uh, for the third quarter reporting period. Um, we're kind of on the cusp, perhaps, of uh, breaking this string of negative earnings on a year-over-year basis. Uh, you know, the consensus estimate, according to facts that right now, calls for a 0.3% year-over-year decline. Um, so that would be the fourth consecutive quarter of negative earnings if it happened to end up that way. But, you know, history suggests that it, it won't end up that way. Earnings typically come in about at least two percentage points better than what the consensus estimate is going into the reporting period. So that said, you know, we could see a, a low single-digit 
growth rate here in the third quarter, which would break that that string. Um, so we're about to hear from the banks later this week, uh, and then the week after that, the next few weeks after that is when you really get into the thick of it, when you get you know, some of the drug companies and the consumer companies and the technology companies um, reporting their results. So a lot obviously riding not really on the third quarter reports so much as what these companies are going to say about the fourth quarter and even what they're thinking about uh, in terms of calendar 2024. Um, and so uh, that's, again, it's, it's one of those points of uncertainty I was referencing earlier. Um, you know, so everyone's kind of sitting back waiting and hoping that we get good news. The jump in rates that we've seen, the elevation in oil prices that we've seen, the resumption of student loan payments, that the federal student loan payments that began October 1. Um, you know, there are some misgivings about the uh, earnings prospects as they relate to the 2024 outlook. And um, so the market just wants to hear some confirmation that it doesn't need to be as concerned as uh, some people think it should be. As we're wrapping up 2023, do you have any thoughts on 2024, or is it just still quarter by quarter in your head? Well, I, you know, it's better 2024. We we talked about this before, in that you know we do have some reservations about you know growth um, yeah. not being as strong as as some think it will be uh, because of the higher rates and because of the lag effect of prior rate hikes kicking in here. Um, and if, you know, if that is the case, then, you know, we might have to see some downward revision to those earnings estimates. Right now, on a year-over-year basis, uh, analysts expect about 12% earnings growth for the S&P 500 2024, uh, which is really nice, you know, and so we could still get some downgrades and remain positive, which is, again, not a bad thing, but it might just uh, force investors to accept maybe some lower rates of return if we get into a period where we have uh, slower growth, that leads to a lot slower earnings growth and, uh, and maybe a market that kind of just chops around uh, moving sideways for an extended period of time um, with, you know, I, most likely a few volatile moments in between. But um, but that's uh, that's the you know current view here. And maybe that gets amended after we hear, um, you know, what we hear coming out of that third quarter reporting period. Um, You said something interesting. We don't have a lot of time, so keep that in mind. You said Mm -hmm. getting investors used to lower rates of return. Um, I try to explain that on this show regularly, that the last 15 years won't be the next 15 years. The last 15 years with low Mm -hmm. interest rates helped the last 15 years. Expect something maybe different. Um, Maybe not like you're talking to your children, but like you're talking to an audience that is terribly well educated on finances. Any thoughts on expecting lower returns? Well, you're right. I mean, we've been blessed, you know, over the last 15 years, certainly with, you know, very low interest rates that have, uh, you know, forced almost the exodus into stocks to get higher returns and a lot of nice growth in there in terms of the companies that are, you know, that have been reporting. Um, But now we have a normalization in interest rates. Um, You know, they're back to where we were prior to the financial crisis. And, you know, the average uh, price return for the S&P 500, you know, over the last 50 years or so is about seven and a quarter percent. So that's before dividends. So uh, so maybe you get somewhere up in the neighborhood of nine percent or so, which which is not bad. You know, we just have to get adjusted to the fact that, uh, you know, rates are going to be higher and it's going to be more challenging to achieve those double digit percentage gains, you know, 15, 20, 25 percent plus uh, that uh, we have not necessarily grown accustomed to seeing over the last 15 years, but which we have seen uh, over that period because of the benefit of such low interest rates. Thanks very much. It's Patrick O'Hare with Briefing.com, a reliable source of domestic and international news that you can use on the economy, on the stock market, on IPOs. If you want to see what's going on today with Birkenstock, they have a nice write-up on it. If you want to see what is going on with the economy, go to Briefing.com. They've got a nice write-up on it. Um, I really, really enjoy good financial content. Probably like some people enjoy a good murder mystery. Uh, It's an industry that I dig. And hearing him have four children that are teenagers and since before he had children, that's that tells you amazing that uh, the longevity of the relationship is based on good knowledge. So listen to his content one more time. Check out briefing.com. I've got an event coming up in San Mateo at the Crown Plaza, October 28th, 10 to noon. You can learn more about that event for the seven retirement readiness tests at robblackshow.com. 
For more information about EP Wealth, visit robblack.com. That's robblack.com. Birkenstock IPO. Let's talk about it. Um, I, I'm not a sandals guy. Nine times out of ten, I'm kind of a Nike running shoe. Dan, the cork sold clogs have lovers. The IPO price is $46 a share. The German shoemaker expected to price its IPO between 44 and 49. It comes out about 46 today. Birkenstock has secured enough commitments to price its offering. Um, it's got a lofty valuation, which kind of reflects its past successes. Um, I do know people who buy Birkenstocks, hold on to them, and they love the brand. If you look at investing in shoe companies, I could only think of four. Forgive me. Crocs, Steve Madden, Deckers, and Birkenstock. And that's how I would order them in my interest. Crocs is the most interesting to me because they make plastic shoes, essentially. Very high profit margins. That's trading for eight times earnings. Birkenstocks can be trading for about 35, which is more than Apple. Now, again, I get the loyalty. I'm not knocking the loyalty. Can't knock the hustle. Can't knock the loyalty. But to me, it looks very expensive. And unless they have an AI strategy, I don't get it. Well, I guess Allbirds is another publicly traded company. Um, that's shoe oriented. But again, putting a gun to my head, I'm not going to buy any of the shoe companies. But if I had to, Crocs is the winner because it's valuation. Um, I'm more interested in um, consumer goods like Louis Vuitton, Moet, Hennessy. Uh, that stock is starting to suffer. Birkenstock um, is kind of in that Louis Vuitton area of perceived, uh, not elegance, but um it's not luxury. It's I, I'm dropping the words. I'm just going to move on to my next idea. But there you have it on my thoughts on Birkenstock's valuation. It just feels a little bit too high. Let's talk about candy and sugar. Way too much is being front loaded into Ozempic. A lot like way too much enthusiasm was front loaded into artificial intelligence. Uh, the weight loss drugs from Eli Lilly and Novo Nordisk are going to destroy the US market for sugary goods. That's a fear. I don't think it's reality. But PepsiCo, Mondelez, Hershey, Constellation Brands, ConAgra, Utz, all publicly traded. It's expected that drugs like Novo's, Wagovi, and Ozempic, Lily's, Monjuro cause weight loss by easing food cravings. Um, are we going to become Ozempic Nation? Who's going to eat the chips away? Um, analysts from Bank of America laid out the case, writing that they expect total calorie consumption in the U.S. to drop between 1% and 3% by 2030, assuming between 20 and 50 million in the U.S. are on anti-obesity drugs. Magovi costs sixteen thousand dollars a year. It's an expensive medication for so many people. Even factoring in the rebates from drug makers that will likely pay pharmacy benefit managers. We've never seen a number like this before. It's a lot like AI. The hype is is in the we've never seen anything like this before on how it could displace businesses. In this case, displace calories. Bank of America said that a recent estimate, he expects 15 million patients on anti-obesity medicines by 2030, equating to 50 billion in spending on the drugs. That's roughly a tenth of the 421 billion spent in 2021. Insurers and government agencies simply won't be able to afford it. Lower prices for the medicine might change insurers' calculus over the long term. Um, it's an interesting thought, right? 
Um, last year, we would look at companies like Pepsi and Coca-Cola and Constellation Brands and Hershey and it says, yeah, there's always going to be that um, visibility into them. Now we're starting to figure out the math on how many people might be taking the drugs and cutting down on the junk food. Um, I think that's an interesting one for, you know, I guess other people to solve instead of me. Exxon's coin pioneer natural resources. I'll give you a hint, hint, wink, wink, nudge, nudge. That tells you that Exxon Mobil thinks oil prices are cheap. There's carryover momentum going on on the stock market today. Um, Ten-year treasuries at 4.58, creeping a little bit lower, a little bit lower. Gold, 18.85 an ounce. Crude oil down 1.4%. Russell 2000s in the green, but not by a lot. The Nasdaq started off stronger, but getting weaker. Same with the Dow. Same with the SP 500. Um, can't say that. Can't say that uh, this is big follow through. Karen Ellison's talking about the shaky finances of Alameda. She's going to go to jail for a long time, but she's going to get a smaller sentence than he will. Dan Bankman Freed started a $2 billion venture fund using Alameda loans. Um, the hate and vitriol online for these two people is is pretty palpable it's pretty crazy anyhow taking a look at stocks today i'm seeing a lot of mixed so i've seen a lot of mixed numbers today big tech seems to be doing fine google's higher meta's higher apple's higher uh, microsoft says they could close the activision deal later this week so that's something to think of you can find me online at rob black show big event coming up October 28th, 10 to noon, the seven retirement readiness tests for retirement. You can check it out at Rob Black Show. It's 10. October 28th, 10 to noon, Crown Plaza, San Mateo, right by the bridge. You can find me online at Rob Black Show. Com. Think you're in good shape for retirement? Find out how you're really doing with the seven tests of retirement readiness. Join Rob Black and CFP Chad Burton of EP Wealth Advisors, Saturday, October 28th in San Mateo. They'll walk you through these seven tests to find out whether you are really ready for the retirement you want. Rob will provide timely commentary, and Chad will share specific strategies for taxes, income, long-term care, safe money, investing, life goals, and more. If you have at least 500000 in investable assets and want to retire better, pass on your estate, and minimize taxes, this event is for you. Find out if you're on the right track with the seven tests of retirement readiness, Saturday, October 28th, 10 a.m. to noon at the Crown Plaza in San Mateo. Space is limited, so sign up today at robblackshow.com. That's robblackshow.com. Can you pass all seven tests? Sign up today online at robblackshow.com.